Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. It is indeed an honor to be here with each of you on this morning. So to my sister on her vacation, which I hope she is relaxing and unwinding, Reverend Charlene Hill, and for the worship committee that said okay to this invitation, I am grateful to each of you. And I must give a special shout out to Miss Denise McKnight, who ensured that all my T's were crossed and all my I's were dotted, that I may be prepared for this morning, so thank you. And to each of you, for all the elbow bumps and the smiles with your eyes I received this morning, I am grateful. So thank you for being here. And one thing that I wanted to, I was reading through the bulletin and I love this opening word that says we open ourselves to God and to each other. That's a word to meditate on, that we open ourselves to God and to each other. I want to thank Sunita for reading the scripture, and I'm going to read it again for your hearing. I think it never hurts to hear the scripture being read more than once just for us to remember it and be holding it in our heart. This morning, Habakkuk 1, chap chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, and it reads like this. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not listen, or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble? Destruction and violence are before me, strife and contention arise. So the law becomes slack and justice never prevails. The wicked surround the righteous, therefore judgment comes forth perverted. I will stand at my watch post and station myself on the rampart. I will keep watch to see what God will say to me and what God will answer me concerning my complaint. Then the Lord answered me and said, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so that a runner may read it. For there is still a vision for this appointed time. It speaks of the end and does not lie. If it seems to tarry, wait for it. It will surely come and it will not delay. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of great hope, who recognizes the struggles in our lives to hold on, to stand up, and to believe when darkness, hurt, and pain seem to be winning. We speak to you in this moment from our hearts, laying out before you all that has captured our attention, stifled our zeal, and kept us from speaking true and honest words to you. We take a deep breath right now, God, and we exhale into a moment of silence. To watch, to feel, and to experience you, O oh God, unlatching the floodgates of our hearts, that we might receive you and the presence of one another. Unbridle our tongues, and God, bend your ear and extend your hand towards us. May this moment of preaching continue to inspire and comfort the comfortable, uncomfortable. And it is your son Jesus' name we pray and say together, amen. Each day we awake to news reports of increasing COVID-19 cases, suicide bombings, hunger, unemployment, murders, and casualties of war. We are living in a politically charged atmosphere that creates fear, promotes xenophobia, and it becomes overwhelming. It is overwhelming. So overwhelming that I decided to turn off my television, limit my social media time, and began binge watching Netflix, manifest in all American to be exact. But that intentional disengagement has not stopped the world from turning, has not stopped crisis from occurring, has not stopped hope being lost. It has not erased the images 
of the January 6th insurrection. It has not erased the image of Breonna Taylor. It has not erased the images of Afghans cleaning, clinging to the wheels of a moving plane. My television may have been off, but the systems of the world remain open and operating at full capacity. You see, I was attempting to escape the inescapable. As Martin Luther King says, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. So whether or not my television was off, I am, was, being affected. And that should give us all pause, that we cannot escape the effects of this system, and that we cannot ignore the plight of our neighbors, even if the television is turned off. You see, Eli Wiesel, a Holocaust survivor and author, wrote these words, I swore never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. Sometimes we must interfere. When human lives are endangered, when human dignity is in jeopardy, national borders and sensitivities become irrelevant. Wherever men and women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must at that moment become the center of the universe. And with all of that swirling in my head, it has become clear that here we all stand in the center of the universe because human lives are endangered. Human dignity is in jeopardy. Women, men, and our neighbors are being persecuted because of race, religion, and political views. And this is not new. It's just now plain as day laying at each of our doorsteps, unable to just simply sweep it under the rug and step over it each day. We can no longer ignore the problems of the world. You see, we each have a responsibility, a role to play. And if you are like me, you may not know exactly what it is, but you know it's something, so you keep showing up. Don't ignore the tug. Engage it. See where it takes you. Do not disengage. We've been disengaged for far too long as the church, as the community, and as individuals. We have become spectators as opposed to engaged participants. And I'm talking to myself too. We've turned to judgment as opposed to justice. And we no longer have the luxury to play it safe. The repercussions of our safe playing are far too great. And what if prophets like Habakkuk had played it safe, become complacent with judgment, failures of systems and the law becoming slack and justice never prevailing? What if Habakkuk had given in to the new world order of the Chaldeans that was forcing large segments of the Jewish population what if Habakkuk had disengaged, not become concerned with the destruction and violence, strife and contention? What if Habakkuk had simply ignored the plight of his neighbors and the reality of his own life? But you see, the tone of Habakkuk, the passion of Habakkuk, the how long, O oh Lord, convinces me that disengagement was not an option for Habakkuk. Disengagement from his community, the country, and the world was not an option. And disengagement from God, the promise of God, the vision of God was not an option. He was to be engaged with the vision of God, the promise of God. The passion of Habakkuk also tells me that faith is not a spectator sport. Our faith makes us cry out. Our faith makes us speak up even when we are afraid. 
because we cannot do this alone. And trust me, I wasn't the only one that turned off my television and wanted to pretend that the world was great. Of course, on my side of the locked door, but disengagement is not an option. When it appeared to Habeka that his faith and that of the community was being attacked due to violence, injustice, and oppression, he did not huddle up with others and come up with reasons why critical race theory should be banned. He did not huddle up with folks and agree with the divestment of the government from public education to shut down South and West Side schools only. Habeka did not huddle up and justify the banning of refugees and immigrants. Habeka engaged his faith in the one who called him as prophet, one who utters divinely inspired revelations. And we have all been called to carry a divinely inspired message. Let's sit with that for a minute. We have all been called to carry a divinely inspired message. And you don't need seminary for God to call you. So if you're thinking, well, God only calls preachers. God only calls pastors. No, no. God calls everything God created to do something great for creation. And because you are created by God, you carry a divinely inspired message. And like Habakkuk, we got questions for God. But even when Habakkuk became overwhelmed with the circumstances that are plaguing the community, violence, the killing of children, black and brown folk, the dismantling of public education, the disenfranchisement of people of color, the xenophobia of immigrants, the class divides, the have and the have not, and now the vaccinated and the non-vaccinated, the continued redlining by banks, how can we not be engaged because we are all impacted? Habeka gives us the example by taking his complaint directly to God who have called him by name, and God has called each of us by name. He takes his complaint directly to God. Habakkuk lays it out. Even if he knows God sees it, Habakkuk lays out the destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflicts abound. Therefore, the law is paralyzed and justice never prevails. Take a moment right now, and you might not be used to this, but take a moment right now and lay out before God in your own language what you have to say to God. And it might not be so pretty. But remember this, God can handle you every complaint and every lament, but lay it out before God. Tell God the challenges you face personally. Tell God the challenges you face as a community that seem insurmountable. Engage God from your heart. Tell God from your perspective, from your experience, from your heart. God can handle every petition, lament, and complaint. And this may feel counterintuitive for many of us because we've been told you can't question God. But one of the first things that Habakkuk does is question God. How long, O oh Lord? And then there were other questions following. How bold that is. But Hebrews 4.16 says to us like a community affirmation, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we are in a time of desperate need. Ask your questions. That is the first line of engagement, and too many folks have disengaged. But we, the church, must know that disengagement is not an option. Habakkuk engages God, even when God assures him that this continued destruction will happen. Habakkuk continues to speak up and boldly ask God, aren't you from everlasting to everlasting? Habakkuk runs the litany of who God says God is holy, 
rock, redeemer, savior, and too pure. Most of us shudder at the thought of being that bold before God, but we have to recall when God says in Isaiah, put me in remembrance. What promise do we need to remind God of? Put God in remembrance. But it does not stop there. With putting God in remembrance, that's just step two, right after asking your questions. Put God in remembrance of the promise and the vision and what does Habakkuk say and do next? Habakkuk heads to his watch post. Has anyone ever told you, tell your story walking? Habakkuk was telling his story walking to his watch post. So after, one, asking your tough questions of God, two, putting God in remembrance, three, head to your watch post the place where God has called you to be the light and to be loved, to do what it is that God has gifted you to do. Watch and deliver the message. Right there, at your watch post, God will answer. So listening is step four. So part of this engagement is doing what God has called you to do. Are you on your post, able to hear God say, write the vision, make it plain, so others may run with it? God is calling you. God is calling us to write the vision, to run with the vision. But we must first be engaged. We must ask God the tough questions. How long, oh Lord? We must put God in remembrance of the promise. We must head to our watch post and we must listen and act. Do not check out on yourself or those around you. Turn the television on. Remind yourself, disengagement is not an option. We have a reason to get out of bed beyond the fact that our feet hit the floor. Our reason is our purpose, which calls us to engage. Engage the world in a way that causes change. You have heard it repeated. Be the change you wish to see in the world. This means that disengagement is not an option. But naps, vacations, and quiet times are allowed. But disengagement from your call, your purpose, and your neighbor is not an option. God became the change God wished to see in the world when the word became flesh and Jesus walked the earth. What change will you make? What change will the church make? What change do we need to see in this world? Show up, engage, because disengagement is not an option. Amen.